you. Thank you, Doug. We really appreciate that this morning. Good to see all of you in church today. And uh, I'll tell you what, for the dog days of summer, you guys are doing a great job getting here. Uh, I know there are people that are away. I know that you have to travel, and I'm okay with all of that. And even if I wasn't, it wouldn't matter because I don't control your life, right? <laughs> Amen. But uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, I love you. I want you to be here with us. And uh, several people out this morning away traveling, and we love them and miss them. If you're, lo- if you're watching online, thanks for being faithful even to attend online. If you're watching the archives, shame on you. You should have been here at night. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're watching the archives. But if you're here, if you're here, you get to see, look around and see all the smiling faces that are here today. And so I want you to do that. I want you to look around. You over here, look at this pretty good looking side over here. And you over here, look at this beautiful side over here. Yeah, yeah. And then turn around and look at the people that are right in the row with you and uh, maybe even reach across and shake their hand. Reach across. Yeah, there you go. Shake their hand. Let them know you're happy to be here. Let them know that you're happy that we can touch one another, shake hands, and be in the room together. That's all wonderful and good. And uh, it's good to have you here in the house of the Lord this morning. Several, several guests today. We're grateful to have you. There are several people who were guests, and now they're just part of us. They've just been coming enough that we're just going to take a big bear hug and just keep them now. And so it's good to have you all here and uh, some new, new folk for the first time today. We want you to know you're welcome here in the house of the Lord. And it's good to have some visitors who worship and minister in other places. And uh, Gina's son, uh, Ethan, is here today. And Ethan's a worship pastor in, is it over near Raleigh? Raleigh? South Carolina. South Carolina. Wow, okay. So it's almost God's country. You've got to go a little more north to get to, yeah. So uh, South Carolina is getting to be God's country. And uh, he's down there. But he's from right here. And uh, we appreciate his ministry there. And he's here ministering. He's here ministering at a camp, and we just, we, we just want to, if you think about it, would you hold him up in prayer? He's ministering to young people. Is that accurate? It's young adults? Yeah, and so we're, pray, we're praising God for, for his willingness to do that and for people's willingness to serve. Uh, lighting a candle in the darkness, and uh, just want God to move in that scenario, and that young people would be challenged and would grow, would grow in Jesus I'm also grateful for another person who did a good job, did a good job lighting a candle in the darkness. We have uh, our own, Lindsay Reed is right down here. She was up here singing. She graduated just a couple days ago from East Davidson High School. And uh, I don't know all the nuances of how exactly it happens, but she was chosen by her professors and by the staff there and the faculty there to give the high school commencement address in front of thousands of people, literally thousands of people. And uh, I've I've actually read recently some of the addresses that have been given by some high school students. And even some of the ones that were given that night, some of the words were talked about some things that are pretty common nodge anymore, words that used to shock us and scare us. And now, unfortunately, in our culture, we just kind of deal with them because they're there and part of our culture. But Lindsay took the opportunity to stand up in front of thousands of people and look back into the Word of God and say to these 200 plus, probably 200 plus graduates, how many graduates were there, Doug? Do you know? 230. 230. Yep, 200 plus graduates. She took the opportunity to stand up in front of them and say, Jesus said, I'm aware of the flowers and the trees and the grass. How much more am I mindful of each one of you? That used to be kind of commonplace. It's special. It's special. And I want, I want her to know how much I respect and appreciate you lighting a candle, lighting a candle and letting people know it's not about what you can achieve what you can achieve. There are some of us here that are wealthy by, by, well, it's all by God's blessing, but we were wealthy because we were just in the right place at the right time. And there are some of us that are not as wealthy as we could be because we were in the wrong place 
at the wrong time. So it's not just about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and working harder and running and chasing your dreams. It's about recognizing that we live in a world that Scripture says it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. And Ecclesiastes says at the end of the day, all of it's vanity, but if we're smart, we'll, look, we'll turn and look back to the one who says, in the middle of all the rain and all the things that are happening, I've got my eye on you and I care about you. And she pointed that out in, in, a, in a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So I want her to know I appreciate that. We got some mail here from another young person here in our church, Dear Life Point Church. Thank you for the graduation gift. It means so much to me to have a church family caring and praying for me. Love Connor Ware. And so we want Connor to know that we are praying for him. We do try to make it a matter of prayer to hold Connor up and he, as he, Logan as well as they're away in school. We've got a lot of opportunities ahead of us as a church. You saw VBS that's coming up. You saw the young adults that are getting together now, young families. And so if you consider yourself a young family, you come. If you're bad at bowling, you come. If you're good at bowling, please don't come because I'm going to be there and I'm bad at bowling. In fact, I, I, I bowl with two hands, right? I, that's, that's kind of how I do it. I just, I just recently graduated from that little rail that they put up there where you set the ball on top and you kind of aim it and you let her go. And uh, so, so you just you know, if you're good at bowling, you come and you show us how it's done. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be excited. So if you consider yourself a young family, we're not just going to put any big age restriction on it. Uh, we want you to know that you're, you're welcome here in anything that we do in the life of the church. And we're grateful for what God is doing. Several new people today, again, I want to just say how grateful I am to have you here and several people who have been gone for a while. And it's so good to have some of you back. So if you have your uh, Bibles, you can turn them to the book of Titus. The book of Titus, this is in the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, it's kind of more towards the back of your Bible. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and then you get to this book, Titus. Titus. And I want to take a few moments to look at this, look at this book, Titus. Look at this letter to this young Greek man that Paul wrote. Look at Titus' responsibility, and look at what it's what he was saying to Titus about the church that he was talking to, and then I want us to see how it translates into, into our lives as well. If you have your, your, you're in your Bibles, Titus chapter, chapter 3, actually chapter 2 is where we're going to be reading, but it's a short book. Just take, your, just take a moment and just look. Titus 1, Titus 2, you can kind of just leaf over. Titus 3, and in three chapters the book is over. And so, but there's some very, very practical application here, and there's some sound doctrine in here, and I want us, I want us to look at this. I want to read chapter 1, and I want to look at verse, verses, verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 5, and then we're going to come back and talk about who Titus and who Paul is. Titus chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a bondservant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords, this truth fits or accords with godliness, and the hope of the eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, and has in due time manifested his word through preaching which was committed to me, talking Paul, Paul saying this, which is committed, committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. All of this is this letter from me to Titus, a true son in our common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. That's how Paul starts a lot of his letters. He says, I want you to know who's writing. I want you to know on what authority I'm writing. And I want you to know who the letter is to. And the idea was that this letter was a certain set of credentials. 
It was a set of credentials because as the letter was written, oftentimes it was either delivered by messenger or delivered by carrier to that person who was in the town where that was happening, or that letter was handed to that person who would then take it out and read it, and the instructions were to go to a place and take that letter out and stand in the midst of that congregation or church and open that letter up and read it. And so what Paul was doing was he was saying, Listen, I've been to the church at Crete. I've helped plant the church at Crete. And now I'm sending you back to do some things for me at the church at Crete. And I'm sending you with this letter. And when you open it up, you'll see. And not only will you see, you'll be able to show people this letter here is from Paul. In fact, you can see that it's written in his own hand. In another passage, he talks about it being written in my own hand. And that person, whoever held that letter, was the person that was supposed to take care of the business. Whatever the letter said, he or she was supposed to take care of the business and the operation of the church in that spot. And that letter was the credentials to be able to do so. It wasn't just simply a letter of communication to talk about the weather. This was, was business. And by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's been canonized and it's part of Scripture, which means it's part of our church business as well. And you read this preamble to this letter where Paul says, this is me and this is why I'm writing and God's given me the ability and the responsibility to preach. And I'm not only passing that responsibility to preach onto you, Titus, I'm actually giving you a job to go and do in the church there at Crete. In chapter 1, verse 5, you'll see that job that he's been given, Titus has been given. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, For this reason I left you. Now you understand that Titus was left there in Crete. So Paul had been there in Crete. He'd observed the issues. He had observed the things going on. And he said to Titus, Look, I'm, I want you to stay and I want you to address these issues. I love you. I'm proud of you. In fact, you'll find that Titus was a, a Greek young man that joined Paul early on in his missionary journey to Asia. This was a young man whose disposition was similar to Paul. He was a problem solver. He was a troubleshooter and had a, clearly must have had a very direct way of saying things. This was a young man who carried the burden for church polity. Do you know what I mean by polity or politics? The way that things should be, church structure, church function. He carried the burden of church polity on his heart. And Paul was saying, look, I'm leaving you in Crete and because I want you to do some things for me. Paul sought to divest himself of the responsibility of caring for that church in Crete. Not to give away the responsibility completely, but he wanted to share it with Titus. And he understood that if a church was to grow, that he, would, he as the leader would have to give up responsibility to the people around him. And you can see that the church at Crete was blessed, and the church at Crete and at Corinth blossomed under Titus's ministry. Paul understood, I've got to give him some responsibility, and you'll see what that responsibility is here in chapter 5, but I want to just, before we get to that responsibility, I want to just stop and say something. It is important for us it is important for us to recognize that if we are going to go forward or together as a church, it is up to me as the pastor, it is up to the worship leader, it is up to the people who are responsible as the steering committee to slowly but surely divest ourselves of responsibility onto your shoulders. That's how we're going to go ahead. But if you hang out in church culture long enough, you'll find out that that's not how it goes. A lot of times people squeeze the, they get, once they get the reins of power, they hang on to them, they pull them, they tug them tighter, they squeeze the gavel, so to speak, they hold on. And I just want us to remind us, and I want to tell you, if you're listening here this morning, maybe you've just come to this church for just a couple times and you're trying to figure out who everybody is, I want you to know personally, I am looking to give responsibility away, not just the work. Now, it's easy to give away. Not just the doing and the logistics. I want to give responsibility, the spiritual responsibility away as well. You know why? Because you are, 
or should be progressing to a point where you are mature enough to handle that. Amen? Amen. If we're not careful, we can, <laughs> we can find a pastor or find a worship team leader, or we can find a pair of worship team leader and pastor, a, a group that does really, really well together, and we can put them up front, and we can just say, hey, teach us, talk to us, let us, and we can sit and we can just soak in and soak in and soak in until there's something we don't agree with. And then all of a sudden, we may not do any homework ourselves. We may not go back and search the scriptures to find out. All of a sudden, we've been hurt or been offended or been damaged or we've got a problem philosophically with what's said. And so we do what happens to a lot of people is we turn and we go and we walk out the door and we never come back and maybe even never back to church. You know what will cure that? What will cure that? What will cure that is when you recognize, because you are taking on responsibility in the church, because when, when it's, what will cure that is when you recognize how difficult the task that we're doing here is. There's several of you that own businesses here in the audience, and you know what it's like to own a business. What it's like to own a business is you get to walk into work on a Monday morning, and you get to look at that person who showed up to do that job at your business, and you tell them, go and do X, Y, and Z. And whether that person wants to or not, whether that person agrees with you or not, whether that person has a different philosophy about how things should be done, that person knows that if they want to receive the paycheck, they're going to have to go and not do X and Y and argue about Z. They're going to have to go and do X, Y, and Z and come back and look for new instructions. But then you walk in the doors of the church and it's different. It's different. I want to take the time to just stop here for just a second to talk to you about the fact that Scripture is very clear and teaches very clearly that there should be structure in a church, and structure should not just be the person at the top, up at the peak and at the pinnacle, and then this flat parallel line at the bottom of everybody else on equal footing. The reality is that God wants to do something in your life and your life and your life. He wants to do something spiritually with you. He wants to do something where you are growing and developing, where all of a sudden you move up a role and you start taking and sharing the spiritual responsibility. And that's what this whole book is about, where Paul is saying to Titus, I want you to talk to the people that are in these these cascading tears, and I want you to let them know that they play an important role in the church. In fact, that's what he tells him in verse 5 that he's there to do. You can see that in chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete. Basically, there are two reasons. That you should set in order the things that are lacking Apparently, nothing is new under the sun. Their church had issues just like any church has issues, except for LifePoint. LifePoint doesn't have any issues, right? <laughs> Your laugh betrays you. Betrays us, I should say. I want you to set in order the things that are lacking, and two, I want you to appoint elders in every city as I have commanded you. There's some things that need to be shored up, Titus. I was there, I saw them, I observed them, and I'm, I'm leaving and I'm putting you in charge and I want you to shore those things up, tighten those things up, and I want you to set in place elders that are over these outlying cities around Crete that people gather together on the Lord's Day for services. When those people gather together, I want you to appoint people that are in charge in those different cities throughout the week. In Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 6, you'll see what those requirements are. Here's what it is, and I want us to look at this because I want us to, this is kind of some of the, this is some of, this isn't the feel-good stuff in preaching, but this is the Word of God, and it's really, really important. And here's what it says, an elder should be appointed if he is a man who is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop 
or a preacher must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast to the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. And I say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. You looked for a pastor for a long time. <laughs> and I was sitting right here. <laughs> now, that's on me. That's not on you. I drug my feet. <laughs> but part of, the reason, part of the reason that I drag my feet is because I realize what Scripture teaches. And Scripture holds in high regard and in high position of responsibility the man of God who would stand before you and say, Thus saith the Lord. And you, I would just say this very carefully, you, if, if God takes you out and takes you away to another church, I want you to know that you should never settle for anything less than what God has written in his word that should be the standard or the watermark for the man of God that stands before you and says, thus saith the Lord. Amen. You should never settle for anything less. So they have a good haircut. So do I. So they have a beautiful wife. I have a better looking wife than they do. So they know all the pithy little sayings. They, they drive a nice car. They, they maneuver and know how to put things together. And the, the production is powerful and booming. And Are they a person who is not given to violence? Are they a person who's not quick-tempered? Are they a person who is a lover of what is good? Someone who's sober-minded? Someone self-controlled? Someone who's willing to hold on to faithful words that have been taught? I would just tell you and ask you and beg you, never settle for anything less than what God has said in his word. If we're not careful, this is a little play on words, if we're not careful... And we don't recognize that there are tears, T-I-E-R, T-I-E-R-S, tears. My, okay, my education, I had to check my teachers. <laughs> I before E except after C. Only an A is a neighbor and way and today and holidays and okay. If we're not careful, if we fail to see the tears of leadership that are in God's word, we will ultimately reap the tears of of leadership. Because no man is an island unto himself, and I promise you it is a heady thing to get a group of people. It's one thing to walk into a, to an office space where you pay people and they do what you want. It's a whole different thing to walk into a group of people who, by their choice, come and give the money to the organization that you're leading. It's a heady, high, powerful thing. And this is why Paul says this is so important that these are the kind of people that you elevate to the top. But he's saying it's not just that person that's at the top. It's ought to be, there ought to be tears of leadership. He goes on in chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, to talk a little bit about what those tears look like. And I would just encourage you to study the Word of God. You will see these kind of things all over and over again. This is not just about men. This is not just about men versus women. This is about men and women. This is not just about the wealthy versus the poor. This is the wealthy and the poor. This is not just about Jews only and people who are law keepers. This is about the Gentiles who were the cast-offs and who didn't have anything to offer, have been brought into the family of God, and we're all part of this new kingdom culture. And he's saying this new kingdom culture needs to work in these tiers of leadership. I don't know why I'm taking so much time to preach about this, but I think it's important for us to understand that you and I have a responsibility to this church. Verse 1, but as for you... Speak the things which are proper and sound doctrine. That the older men, Titus, tell the older men to be sober and reverent and temperate, sound in faith and in love and in patience. That's a responsibility to all of you who would consider yourselves older men. The older women, likewise, be sober and reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love and 
excuse me, that they would, excuse me, the older women likewise, that they would be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, and that they, listen, that they would admonish the young woman to love their husbands and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good and obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Wow. What a powerful statement to older women whose responsibility it is to teach the younger women. And lest you young men think you get off scot-free, the next statement is, the next statement ought to cause you to take a deep breath. Likewise, Titus, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. And listen to this, that one who is an opponent, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say about you. If you think anybody has responsibility, I'm going to lump myself in with you young guys we have responsibility. We have responsibility to live a life that is so far above reproach that the people who are our detractors, the people who look onto our life and say, that guy has a problem. What's his issue? What's, what's his big deal anyway? What's he, tr- what's he trying to prove? The people that are, are our detractors, Scripture says you need to live in such a way where those people say, I, there, I, what can we say about him? In fact, I'm... <laughs> I'm ashamed that I'm even thinking anything negative about him. That guy is such a solid, good guy. He's untouchable. What a high bar. What a high bar. Not only does he move from older men and older women to younger women and younger men, he turns and he goes in verse 9. He says, exhort bond servants. In that day and age, there was absolutely okay to have slaves. In fact, if you didn't have money, that's what you did. You sold yourself into slavery, so to speak, and almost like taking a job, right? You took a job with somebody. And you said, look, I'm, gonna, I'm contractual labor for you, and that's what he's saying here. He said, yeah, I want you to exhort those people who are in the lower tiers economically who are, who are bond servants or in contractual relationships to be obedient to their own masters, well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior and all things. What's he talking about? He's talking about a culture that is markedly different from the world around it. He's talking about a culture that stands out in sharp contrast to to a, 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 a culture that they were a part of that was grab and growl and take in and do all that you can and heap unto yourself. And what feels good, just do it. And what's right for you is right for you. And what's right for me is right for me. And that's kind of where we're living today. And he was saying, no, no, no. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be aware. Be biblical. Be thinking. Be someone who has spiritual integrity. Be someone who lives a life that's so far above reproach that your detractors can't even say anything about it. Even when you go to work, even when you punch the clock, make sure that when you write on your time card it's 10 o'clock, make sure it's 10 o'clock, not 10.01. Amen? He was saying live lives that are so far above reproach that it attracts the world around you. That's what he told Titus. He said, I want you to walk in and say that to these people. And these people are going to be like, whoa, what are you talking about? How, I I hear what you're saying. How are we supposed to go about that? And that's, that's kind of what I want to get to today. And if you'll look forward in chapter three, you'll see the things that he's finishing. He's finishing telling Titus, go ahead and finish telling them chapter three, verse nine, but avoid Foolish disputes on Facebook. No, he didn't write that, but he said, avoid foolish disputes. And I would add on Facebook, on social media, I would add at your family dinner. Whatever you feel about the shot or the vaccine, if you want to talk about it, come talk to me. I'll listen. But you've got a family to win. 
You've got sons and daughters that are looking on. You've got, you've got children that are looking on. You've got, you've got grandkids that are looking on. And, and if, if we're not careful, they can say, man, it seems like grandma's done a lot of research about this shot. I don't think I've ever heard her do a lot of research or that much research about what's in the Word of God. Boy, it seems like Grandpa's really got a strong opinion about that, and it seems like all of a sudden when he talks about the leader of our nation, it seems like he uses words that he wouldn't use to talk about his enemy. We've got a world to win. We've got a world, whether you like the leader or not, we've got a world to win. We've got family to draw and attract to the Word of God and to our way of living and thinking. We've got a family whose, families whose lives need to be prepared for eternity. He said, avoid these foolish disputes. Avoid worrying about genealogies or who came from what or who's in line for who. Don't avoid, avoid foolish contentions and strivings about the law for they're unprofitable and useless. And then he not only says that, but he says this powerful statement. It would shake me up to think what a church, what happened might happen in churches if pastors really took the responsibility to do this right here. Verse 10, read it for yourself. Reject, 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 reject a divisive man after the first and the second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and self condemned. I thought we were supposed to love everybody. We are. We are. I thought the doors were supposed to be open. They are. 100%. They are. But if somebody came in here with the intention to hurt you, if someone came in here with the intention to do physical harm to you, a bunch of us would stand and run right at them. A bunch of us would reach for the things that we carry. Some of you, I don't carry. Some of you carry in this room. Who shall remain nameless, but uh, I'm glad it's you and not me. In fact, I'm even nervous that it's you. I've told people, if something ever goes off at Life Point Church, I'll probably die in the crossfire for my own people <laughs> before whoever it is ever gets a chance to do anything. They're not looking for me anyway, I promise. <laughs> Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. We've spent too much time talking about this, which is actually encouraging because it allows me to preach what I want to preach next week. I just want to, I want to remind you, and maybe this was all for, maybe this was all for, you know, I was, I was, I told, I tell Doug, well, actually Doug asks typically today, I think this week I told you, this, I beat you to it this week. Doug asks, what are you preaching on? And I told him, <laughs> and the songs, I want to say something, the songs are right on today, right on to this passage of Scripture. Oh, the reason I want to take the time to set this up is because we all have a tremendous responsibility to see this thing go forward. Last week, we talked about the fact of the difference between Elijah and Elisha. We talked about the idea that Elijah was passing the mantle of responsibility down to Elisha, and Elisha had to stop and pick that mantle up and walk to the Jordan and believe that what had happened in the past could happen for his generation. But today, today, the statement that goes out from the Word of God is not just in fact, it's mainly not to young people. Mainly it's to the older crowd, the more mature crowd. Mainly it's to people who are spiritually mature. It's to the people who have been thinking. Not only is it to them, it's to people who are in spiritual leadership or should be in the church. And the call goes out to Titus by Paul to say, get in that church and straighten things out and let's have unity that takes us where we need to. But I can assure you, I can promise you that if it were just someone coming in and a young man walking into this service, like Titus would have walked into that service and holding it up and saying, I've got a letter here from the boss and he's got a problem with you and he's got a problem with you and he's got a problem with you and you're not, and you're divisive and it's a problem. People would have said, whoa, out. 
the reality is that Paul says to Titus, go and straighten things out, but I want you to know that the reason you can straighten things out and the reason you should straighten things out is because we've got a massive responsibility and we've got massive power to be able to help us accomplish that responsibility. It's right here in chapter 2, verse 11. For, by, for the grace of God, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's appeared to those who are outside the fold of faith. It's appeared to those who are at the edge ready to step into the fold of faith. It's appeared to those who are in the fold of faith and not really sure which way to go. And it's appeared to those people who have been at it for a long time and are trying to continue to sort things out and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we, we together should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people sell us to good works. That's the power to be able to live a life where a leader is above reproach and an older man teaches a younger man and a, and a, and a, a woman, an older woman, talks about how to be submissive and obedient and, and, and live under the umbrella of protection of her husband and how young men have the ability to be able to live lives that are above reproach, so far above reproach that no one could ever say anything about them. It comes from the grace of God that is operating in our lives, not just to allow us to jump in and jump out of the grace of God or to abuse the grace of God. No, it actually calls us, it's the grace of God that, that helps us to live lives that are completely separate and pure and wholesome and holy and trophies of his grace. It's that grace that's appeared to every single person. And it's that grace that wants to come and teach you how to live what I just described. It's only by living like that. It's only by living lives that are pure and wholesome and holy. It's only by living lives that are turning 180 degrees from the world and now walking in the steps of Jesus Christ. It's only by living lives that are, that are, that are meeting the qualifications of Scripture and letting Scripture influence and encourage our lives and holding God's standard and God's word up and saying, Lord, help me to apply that to my life. It's only by living that way that we can be a church that has the tears of leadership as opposed to the tears Does that start with new people? Yeah, it can. Does that start with young people? It can. Scripture is very clear that if an older person won't step up, God will raise up a king named Joash. God will raise up a shepherd boy named David. God will raise up a, the right person for the right circumstances if the older people will not step up. But the reality is that over and over again in Scripture, Scripture teaches us that it's a top down. It's an age down. It's a wisdom down category. And he says to those of you who are mature, those of you that know what you're doing, those of you that have seen life, hey, it's our responsibility to share together. But I'm also going to give you not only the responsibility, but I'm going to give you the power to do that, to deny ungodliness and to eschew Job. God said, to, God said about to Satan, he said about his servant, he said, have you considered my, so, my servant Job? I want someone who's upright and who shuns, who walks away from evil, who runs, who gets away as far as he can. God can give you the power to live like that. He can give you the power to live just and pure and right and holy before him. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, for, I, yes, last week we, we encouraged the young people, hey, listen, the God of Elijah is still with Elisha. Take up the mantle. Let's do something about that. Let's strike the water. Let's cross the Jordan on dry ground. Let's get out and make a difference here in our church. Today, I want to invite those of you who are 40 and above. 
to acknowledge your role and your place and your part here and what we're doing in a part of this. And I want those of us who are, did you hear me say those of us who are not yet 40? I want, to, I want us to gather around you. And I want us to pray for you. And I want us to hold you up. Guess what? We're walking in your footsteps. You ever seen, of course it doesn't snow here. Not much. A lot of snow here is this much. That's a lot of snow here. I came from a place where there was a lot of snow. You ever seen that little video of the dad that's taking normal steps in the snow? And that little boy's behind him going. And he turned around. There's just one set of footprints. What are you doing? I'm walking in your steps. Guess what? We're walking in your steps, older person. And for us, financially, how do we get there? For us, wisdom-wise, how do we make such smart decisions? These guys have done it. They've been at it. For us, leadership-wise, we're trying to catch up. Would you help me commit today to being the kind of people that turn around and say, hey, listen, you, come on, come on. I'll take you. You can follow me spiritually. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to live that kind of life. I'm willing to live a life that is above, beyond reproach so that you, as you see me, can follow me all the way to heaven. I'm willing to live a life that's what, Philipp, or excuse me, what this book talks about, Titus chapter 2 talks about, a life that is separate and pure and right before God. And a life that gives us the opportunity to turn around and look at everybody else and say, hey, like it or not, our church is headed in the right direction. We're headed towards heaven. If you're that person this morning, 40 and above, I'd like you to just, just where you are, just stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. And you're saying, hey, listen, I want to be a part of this. I want to live that kind of life. And then here's what I'd like you to do. If you're that person who's standing, I'd like you to just kind of scoot towards the center. And if you're below that age, I'd like you to step towards the perimeter. Step towards the perimeter. There's some people I didn't even know were 40. Yeah. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Those of you who are on the perimeter, I'd like you guys to come just stand right here. Would you guys do that? Would you just come stand right here? Peyton, I'd like you to come and stand right here. Ashley, uh, y'all, would you, would, you, would you come stand with us? Would you come stand with us? Just right there on the, just right there on the, Kara, would you come stand with us up here? Nate, would you come stand with us up here? We've, it's kind of hard to lay hands on all these people. We've kind of gathered them all in one little spot. We're asking the Lord to help us grow this year. Kara, can you just step up here, ladies, and let him through? There you go, perfect. Here's what I want us to do. I want our, I want our, our music minister to come, and I want him to pray a prayer of blessing and ask God to apply this truth to our hearts and lives this morning. I want to I do what's right on behalf of our church. I want to take us where we ought to go. But that may mean that I need to get on board with what you're saying. I need to listen to your wisdom. I need to follow your lead. I, we get to share in the responsibility together. And so I want you to pray for us this morning and let God ask God to help us as we move forward. Let us pray. Lord, in Philippians, you say, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. So I pray, Lord, that we will value others more than we value ourselves. Lord, help us keep our eyes on you. Help our steps so that we can be in line with your divine leadership. Lord, I ask you not to allow us to rely on our own strength, but to rely on your strength, Lord, as we continue to be leaders in our church. Lord, help us to be wise in our decision making. Help us to follow directions you have laid out for us in your holy word. Lord, please give us the courage to speak to others about the gospel, to let them know what you have done for us and help us to turn away from sin. And as we continue to grow older, Lord, as we continue to approach that finish line, I just ask you help us to, as we grow closer to the end of that race, that we be godly examples for our families for our friends, for our co-workers, 
and for future generations of Life Point Church. Thank you so much for all you've done for us and all the things you will do for us, Lord, and just continue to let your light shine through each and every one of us.